Angelo John Lewis with the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Diversity and Spirituality Network is a group of folks who are exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. You can find more about us by going to our website, diversityandspirituality.com. Today, we're going to explore the topic of changing religion in an increasingly secular world. And I have two guests that are eminently qualified to explore this subject. The first is Corrine Archer, who is a principal leadership coach and organizational development consultant at the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations. Previously, Corrine worked in the faith sector within a variety of denominations for over 10 years. Mark Argent is a spiritual director, retreat giver, and organizational consultant. Mark is also an elder in the United Kingdom's United Reform Church. Kareen and Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Now, since we're talking about religion and society, I think it's fair to have you tell me a little bit about your own religious backgrounds. And uh, Mark, um, I, I know it's kind of a long story, so um, we have about 50 minutes, so please keep it <laughs> relatively short, if you can. Uh, Corinne, you can go okay. start. It's an alphabetical <laughs> order here. Okay, so my background is a not a complex one. I grew up in the church. Um, my my parents were Methodists, so I went to Methodist church with them. And um, I I always believed that there was more than me. And I think that my personal commitment to faith happened when I was probably in my 20s. I think the thing about growing up in church is it's easy to have inherited faith, but it's not a faith that belongs to you. And um, it's when you start to realize that it means something more than what your parents say and just a way of being, that it, it sort of changes. And as part of that, I um, worked in the faith sector for, um, for about 10 years, with different organizations and church organizations um, and just really engaged with what it means to be to be a Christian and um, to try to live that way in the world that we live in now. But it's, it's a challenge because um, for me, I felt that church was really out of step with the real world. And, and although faith is, um, I still think, real and relevant and, and valid, it's not experienced as such. And, and for, for more and more people, it's, it's, it's not foundational. Um, so you seem like there's something, rather than it being a core value, it's, it makes you just seem as being a bit strange um, in the wider society. Mm. And I think that, um, I, I don't know if this is, a, I think this is probably a common story, that people who work in the faith sector often get burnt by the faith sector. And um, after that amount of time of working, with churches and Christians and believing or expecting a different kind of behavior from them. Um, I found it was, I just stepped away. It was just too many difficulties and um, too many um, other issues that weren't addressed and were masked over by faith behavior. Um, so I stepped away and um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's the, some, when something's foundational, it never really leaves you. So I've always, ended up being drawn towards spirit, things about spirituality and working in the faith sector or working with faith, things that are faith elements have, you know, faith to it. Um, yeah. So here we are now. Yeah. That's re really interesting. It's like, you know, um, <laughs> you're in a faith organization. Mm. Everybody is a big believer. That doesn't mean that um, everything works well in the organization. No. It has nothing to do with it. No, it, it, <laughs> In fact, it Absolutely. can be the opposite kind of thing. I think I've experienced some of the worst behavior um, <laughs> amongst people working in the faith sector. Just, you know, it's just, it's just unbelievable stuff. So, yeah, it's good to... to <laughs> yeah, I think that the problem is, I think, is our expectations of them are so much higher that we think they're going to live their lives to a different standard. Mm. But 
you know, regardless of the sector that you're in, managers are managers, and sometimes they don't know how to manage, they don't know how to treat people. So, um, you know, it's, it becomes difficult. So, Mark, please introduce yourself to us in terms Absolutely. of your religious background. Um, I grew up in the United Reformed Church, which um, in, in US terms means Presbyterian. Um, actually, the union of two churches, but I'm on the Presbyterian end of that. Um, got involved in Ignatian spirituality, which is a bit of the Catholic world, and have done quite a lot of retreat centre work, um, sort of giving retreats and one-to-one -one and group spiritual direction. Get kind of involved in the group relations world because there's a fairly natural linkage between those two. Um, certainly if you're coming out of a tradition that thinks in terms of God encountered in the process of a group rather than something else. Um, and right, kind of picking up on Corrine's point, I mean, that um, I think one shouldn't put the religious world on too much of a pedestal because it can get nasty. And I know um, for me, there was some, one of my baptisms of fire was actually involvement in my own denomination's engagement with the gay issue, which was a very long and tortuous debate. Um, we've ended up in a very gay friendly position, but certainly it was a complicated journey there. And I think um, a very delicate task of engaging with the shock of people on the other side of the fence who suddenly discovered that the world was um, rather more gay friendly than they'd expected. Hmm. You know, um, both of you are involved in this thing mm -hmm. called Tavistock Group Relations, and um, probably a lot of people that listen to this have no idea what, with what that is. So um, one of you probably should give a brief description as to what okay. it is. Um, I, I can, I'll give a go. I'll have a go. <laughs> um, group Relations is um, an experiential way of learning. So people have an opportunity to come to a what we call a conference. Um, but it's really a learning event to think about how their behaviour impacts others in a group situation. And of, of, often we are working and parts of groups, we're parts of groups in terms of our family systems and our work systems, but how we function in those systems isn't really considered or analysed. And a lot of the behaviours that we have from, brought from home end up in organisational spaces. So it's to help people to make the connection between what has happened in the past and the markers of behaviour that they carry um, from their home, that family system into their work context and other contexts and, and the impact it has on others and the impact it has on themselves. Because it's learning how to take up certain roles, why you take up certain roles, why you don't take up other roles, why you're given other roles. So um, that's a, the um, a group relations conference or event is an opportunity to really look closely at what's going on under the surface of your own mind and your behavior when it comes to group behavior. One of the things I do when I attempt to explain it to other people, um, not being an expert, but I think one of the things that's different than the, the sort of the American mm. personal growth tradition is around this, this um, understanding of group, the importance of group and how that impacts mm. individual behavior as opposed to the other way around, which is kind of how we we in America often do it. So anyway, that's um, my little contribution to the to the subject. So I wonder, um, give me some sense, both of you, uh, either 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 of you or both of you, um, what is your sense? You're both religious people. I think I, I get that that's very important to you. Uh, how does that impact the work that you do? You're also consultants um, and you're living in a world um, as you, we both have, we, you both indicated in certain ways where religion's changing a lot. And it's it's not even cool in many sectors to be religious. And maybe that's a really hard one to answer because you you can't um, you can't take that part of yourself out of yourself to find out what it would be like if it weren't there. So it's kind of everywhere, and maybe you you live it sort of instinctively um, until the moment comes when you suddenly realise you're holding something that's a bit different from other people. Um, I suppose a, a very brutal example would be in an organisation if it thinks its primary task is to make as much money as possible. Um, I think somebody with a religious background might sort of raise a question mark at that and say, hang on, what do you actually mean? With the sort of, in a sense, the complicated questions of what is and isn't acceptable and what that kind of implies. 
And I think maybe there's also a collective bit in terms of how you think about society and social engagement. Um, Because actually, is the world all about me as an individual or is it about something going on in terms of a shared process? Um, Which kind of maps onto the way religious people have have often at their best held a sort of altruism that enables things to grow for. Um, It's not narrowly the benefit of society, but there's something about God seen in other people which kind of raises everybody up. Yeah, I think I guess maybe a better way to rephrase the question is that okay, so you you're you're people that will will be work and interact in secular organizations. So it really becomes a a matter of how yeah. they interact with you as a religious person. That's really sort of more the issue. So maybe maybe you could speak to that, Corinne. Um, I think that um when you're I mean, I wouldn't call myself a religious person. I would call myself a woman of faith. And um the way that that colours my behaviour is that I think there's more than me and I think there's more than me in everybody so when I how I behave when I'm consulting Mm. is to I'm working with the unconscious processes that are going on in the organisations and the different behaviours but also thinking about um, what's beyond that as well Um, what they might be bringing in terms of their own traditions and spirituality into that space Um, and just trying to to hold the multiple identities that most people have. So I don't think it really changes the way I behave more than um, t- trying to open up the, um, the way of engaging with people. So you don't like see an issue if like you're working in an in a, in a organization where people are um, sort of, um, how can I say it? I mean, they, they just consider themselves secular people, basically, and yeah. their values are secular, far um, secular. Um, maybe they have some, you know, they grew up in, in a religious background or something like that. My but, daughter um, obviously now hello. wants to join the conversation. <laughs> say hello. <laughs> hello. Yeah, you're supposed, supposed to be, to be asleep, asleep, dear. How okay, are you? Good. I'll talk to you later. Go on. Off you go. Bye-bye. 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 Go on. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, I kind of knew that would happen. <laughs> she was tucked up in bed. And well, she, she, thought, she's add, she adds, yeah, adds an exactly. element of reality to the situation. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. So, I mean, I guess I'll restate my question. So you, you go into an organization and this organization is secular, qua secular. Mm-hmm. The people don't want to hear about religion. They've got issues. Um, I mean, what does that look like? Is that just normal for you? That's normal business? Or is there a, a, any element in there that is um, maybe distinct and, and um, perhaps challenging for you? I think for me, and Mark might have a slightly different spin on this, but I think for me, Where it makes a difference is that some sectors are more easy to understand. So, for example, working in the when the work I do in the art sector is easier to understand because I know that foundational is their central belief of um, about themselves of being an artist. And then there are other sectors that are harder to work in. So, for me, working in the um, in a sector that's purely financial is more difficult because actually the 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 thing that's driving them is 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 money, and that's that's harder to engage with. So, in values organisations, you understand that there's something deeper that is motivating the behaviour of the people in the system that you're working in. I don't know if you would add anything, Mark, or you've hmm. got a different thing. Um, no, I, in a sense, I go along with that, and I suppose the bit I pick up as well is something about what goes missing. So, in mm-hmm. the um, both in the financial world and the techie world. Um, the sense is that the values bit's often um, not obvious, mm. and I, my sense is that there's a violence being done to people precisely because that's being left at the door. So you sort of spot it, spot it by its absence rather than by its presence, which then kind of leaves the question of what's happening to somebody to make them um, want to function in that world or as they function in that world. Mm. Well, I mean, to turn it around, because Corrine, and I'm building on what you what you said earlier, Corrine, I don't remember if it was part of the podcast or not, but also the, you've, you've worked uh, in the faith sector, yeah. and that's a challenging sector, yeah. um, as, as you said. Um, so speak to that a little bit. I mean, you would think everybody's got the same values pretty much, or at least 
the same, they, exp they, they, they say that they expel the same value. What, what are the unique challenges in, the, in that sort of environment? Um, I think the unique challenges is um, there are the ordinary pressures of work deadlines, getting things done in a timely fashion, delivering um, events and um, meeting with people in a certain way. But the reality is that certain things still have to function. So I worked to, to give a bit more detail. I worked for two churches that were completely different. One was an Anglican church and one was um, a Nigerian Pentecostal church. And I worked for a Christian organization that has a global outreach. And um, in, in working for the churches, you know, there would be times when, you know, getting things ready for a service would be the more important than the people that you were serving mm -hmm. and I think that that can happen in in any sector and in fact I counter it a lot in my work with the health sector now yeah. that um, the, the task becomes greater than the um, objective of what you're trying to achieve. Anything to add to no, that Mark? Very much, very much go along with it um, it's really interesting how you can get the double talk of an organization that's values try and be positive about people and actually does a lot of damage along the way um, i don't know what this is, this is true but um I've, I've read studies that say that it's like they compare different societies and um like the netherlands is supposed mm -hmm. to be one of the more secular societies um in the so-called western world and um by some measures the united states is probably more religious at this point than the uk is so I know this is a kind of broad question, but what is your sense as to how religion plays out in the public sphere in the UK? Gosh, it's become a very contested space. Um, it, in some ways, it's almost unacceptable. Um, so for a frontline politician to name themselves as a person of faith has become quite a controversial place. And the difficulty of that is that it means you end up seeing, in a sense, quite rigid parodies of faith rather than um, the people where it's running at considerable depth. Um, so, for example, just thinking of my own political party, um, one of our elder statesmen is Shirley Williams, who is a devout Catholic, and there is a quality of depth to her, but I've never heard her actually make a fuss about it. Whereas um, our last party leader um, got himself in hot water by... Um, failing to answer a question about whether he considered gay sex to be sinful in a terribly coherent way in an interview. And in a sense, the, sh the shallowness and the abrasiveness of the answer turned it into a, a fuss about him presenting as a persecuted Christian. And the sense was actually what was, was kind of screaming was the shallowness of that. So it's become a space where actually the, in a sense, the people of depth tend not to talk, not tend not to wear it on their sleeves. And I think one of the flip sides of that is you then get people um, slightly scared of it. So slightly scared, for example, of religious fundamentalism, because it's the only form of religion that's visible, um, which kind of makes the public discourse quite difficult to hold on this one. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the whole fundamentalism thing sort of mm -hmm. colors the whole religious space in a mm -hmm. certain sense. Yeah. Uh, anything you want to add on that, Corinne? I, I, I think I think also um, because there are so many negatives associated with with um, people um, who have a, a belief in something and, and in religion that um, as being the benchmarks for no, you know, you don't do this and you don't do that and you don't behave in this way. And I think that um, the rigidness or what is perceived as being rigid is is um, what repels people. It doesn't feel as though you can um, live up to that. And I think that's part of what, um, in a more as the world becomes more inclusive, to be um, someone who belongs to um, a belief system that says no to things is really challenging for a lot of people. Everybody just wants, you know, there's um, mm. it's um, everybody wants there to be a common denominator of just acceptability. There is no truth, but universal truths. Um, and I think that's a challenge. Hmm. Say no to something. What, what, like for, um, for example, so what do you mean? As, you know, as Markham sort of alluded to about, um, there's in, it's, it's in, improved, but generally um, in in a lot of 
um, Christian denominations, they would say that homosexuality is not acceptable, um, that type of thing. I mean, I think things have moved on, but the association is still very powerfully um, alive with mm. that kind of way of being. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet, we also have respect for people like um, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, where there's actually a profound depth in the spirituality going on, um, and actually the sense that these are people of enormous wisdom, where the spirituality is part of who they are, which has enabled a very rich contribution. So it's kind of a schizophrenic thing. On one on one hand, we revere uh, your Mandelas and your Martin Luther Kings, etc., but if you are to proclaim that you're part of that particular faith tradition, that's not considered sort of kosher or something. Use an unfortunate <laughs> word. Or it, or it may be that these are people who've um, been placed in extraordinary difficult situations and found the resources to cope with that. And maybe one of the religion, things religion does is enable that process to happen. But it kind of becomes obvious when you're caught in those very difficult places, which in a sense none of us actually want to find ourselves in. You know, I mean, we're, 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 I guess we. the question was about religion in the UK and what, what that means in the public space. But the larger question is about where the society yeah. is increasingly a secular society. That mm. just seems to be where it's going. Um, I doubt whether it's going to go. Well, I don't know. It depends on where we're talking about, for example. But um, whenever I've seen studies in the, in the at least in, in the so-called developed world and mm. also in the developing world, um, there's this sense um, either... Um, um, there's this kind of um, bubbling up of so-called new new religious movements, which is all over the world, or the sort of established religions uh, are no longer as popular. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm making it more complicated than it needs to be. But in any in any event, in the societies that we're most familiar with, us it's, it's increasingly a secular space. So that brings up a lot of challenges for pe people of faith and probably for the society um, in, in and of itself. I, I, sorry. So, I mean, I've just made a speech, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. <laughs> My thought is, is, is this. I think that um, people are looking for faith in new forms. And it's, um, faith is replaced by other ways of engaging, that it's replaced by um, other religions. So, you know, there's the, the rise of Buddhism. There's a, a profound um, commitment and belief in things like mindfulness. And I think that people are looking yes. for God in other spaces. Um, and they think that actually that, you know, their belief in themselves is probably enough. You know, that's enough to get through. If I can, if I can keep it together, I don't need anything or anyone beyond me. Um, so I think that's, that's a big shift. Mm. Mm. You know, you've, you've, um, in, in, in this workshop, which I, either you did or you, you, you wanted to do, you talked about the Equality Act in the UK that r makes religion a protected class under discrimination law. So what's the impact of that law and how does that affect people at work? How does it affect people who have people of faith at work? It, in some <laughs> She's just part of the podcast. Part of it. That always I'm happens. It. <laughs> I guarantee it. Sorry. In, in some ways, I suppose it, it it it's really positive because it makes it. Um, but it, you probably should say what the what the Equality Act is. I, okay. um, most of people listen to this are from the US. I mean, these, the Equality Act brought together a lot of pre-existing legislation into a single um, equality. Act of Parliament and uh, overseen by a single equalities body, which is, is, is its aim is to stop discrimination. So you have a set of protected. So it's yeah. basically a discrimination okay. law against um, well, people, 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 people of faith. Of faith. It, it allows you to bring in for discrimination yes, on grounds of, I'm going to forget the full list, but race, gender, sexual orientation, marital status, age. So religion is part of that process. I mean, in some ways, it's been very, very positive because it does mean that you. Um, you have a way of dealing with things that previously you would have been quite difficult to take legal action over. Um, and that's really useful for kind of promoting equalities and things. Um, the sort of flip side is it can make some things sort of harder to talk about. And um, the thought, for example, with religion is that um, 
if you're in a secular workspace, it, it probably pushes into the category of not to be talked about in case you upset people. And the thought is that actually it might be quite a basic part of being human. And so if you're not able to talk about it, um, kind of where does that energy go? And possibly you end up with um, the strident voices being the ones who are going to talk about it anyway out of a sense of kind of proselytizing or very assertiveness, which is what the Equality Act is trying to mitigate against. Um, and that means the much more sensitive stuff kind of disappears. And I'm thinking there, um, I mean, somebody like Anna Samadella is an interesting example of somebody finding resources in their faith tradition to do something remarkable. Then you then create a world where you can say what they did was amazing, but it becomes much harder to talk about the, the spiritual resources they might have been drawing on. Or if you do do that, it puts it into a, um, a very tightly defined box where in a sense at its healthiest it's kind of thoroughly integrated into the into the humanity of the person so let me just push back a little bit why why is why is it important to be able to talk about these kind of things you know in other words like um, to some extent a lot of it's challenged channeled into sort of spiritual uh, not spiritual what's the word um secular type things so mm -hmm. i may have a particular faith about um, something in a particular way that's informed by my faith so nowadays that's kind of like um, a lot of that stuff is kind of put in human re human resource language let's let's say so uh, i'm just i'm just trying to understand what you mean exactly by um things that um people can't talk about what do you mean by um, that if i give a slightly different example that just might make sense of it um if you think of a, of a workplace situation where everybody's talking about um relationships with partners of the opposite sex so you've got an entirely heteronormative setup what does that do to the person who's gay or single in terms of feeling that they can't talk about things that are important to them um it's absolutely fine if they get the message and it is okay to talk about that but there's the awkward space where that message hasn't got across i think for the religion one the difficulty is that you from the beginning you're dealing with fairly sensitive stuff and the question is if i name what's going on for me is that acceptable um or is it going to um cause real discomfort um and i suppose um the sort of example i'm thinking of here is the way people kind of almost unwittingly define themselves by their religion and if you then can't name it you've got something going on that's quite important about your definition um and i'm thinking here in the in uk terms um deep divisions between Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland and in bits of Scotland. So if the law says you can't name the religious bit of that, you've still got the divisions floating around, but you've then lost the way to talk about it, which might be wonderful for helping people to come together, but might also mean you've got a, a division that's going on that's just getting expressed in other terms. <laughs> So, Corinne, to me, this this is sort of like falls into the into the kind of rubric of being able to bring your whole self to work kind of thing. So, um, you know, so I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what it's your thoughts on, on that. Exactly are. the thought that I was having that it is aligned to that that idea of bringing your whole self to work. And um, and I was thinking, well, the most most of the people of faith that I know, faith is not an add on. It's it's central to who they are. So to suppress something that's quite essential is is quite challenging and, and allows it means that they can't really be who they are. Or just to be able to say something really ordinary. I went to a church event or, you know, we went to church on Sunday. People don't really say things like that anymore. It would be seen as being quite strange to say something like that, and even though lots of people do. Um, and I think that it's with any kind of um, exclusion, I think it just means that people are less 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 free, less able to be who they're meant to be, and it's it's mm -hmm. you know then what else is excluded from the conversation that it doesn't seem quite fitting anymore. And you know mm -hmm. it's one thing if your faith is something that is you know that can be um, is not so overt. So like Christianity, you don't necessarily need to name yourself as being a Christian, but if you are a someone who's Muslim, or if you're um, if you're Jewish, and they you know um there are other faiths that actually their, their markers are quite visible 
Um, and it, it means that those people are really challenged to suppress something that's quite important or to have to sort of walk in it every, all the time, you know, like to wear it, kind of carry it all the time, which I think can be quite a burden. Yeah, you know, it, it seems like a, particularly um, an issue among people that don't are not in the mainstream mm -hmm. in terms of their faith traditions. The mainstream in the in the case of the UK, United States, may, it, may, it could be a, you're, you're a Muslim, you remember one of these mm -hmm. these new religious movements, or, um, or or even if you're Jewish, basically, um, mm -hmm. it becomes yeah. more of an issue. I think I think if you um, if you turn up and you're some sort of new age spiritualist, that's somehow much more acceptable than um, than being in you know something that's more established <laughs> because of the associations <laughs> of with um, some of the mainstream um, you know, established religions. So I guess the larger question to use your sort of expertise, um, since, since both of you are both people of faith and also people that are involved in, um, uh, you know, group relations, um, in the sense that we're becoming a more secular society, uh, what does this mean in terms of the, for the unconscious? What, what is going on that, that is not perhaps as healthy for society um, in terms of the, the gradual secularization of life? No, you're looking at me, or are you looking for to say something? something? <laughs> well, I, I suppose what I my first thoughts on that is a is a very Jungian one. Um, I mean, Jung came up with this, I think, really useful idea that progress in the West has come at the at the expense of our ability to feel. So a lot of the unconscious stuff gets pushed away in order to um, achieve the sort of successes which have delivered massive technological advances. But we've paid a fairly heavy price for that, um, and I think that's getting put getting pushed further away as as we develop. And if you compare that with bits of the world that which, um, if you like the language of development, will be described as less developed, you see something uh, there actually very rich going on that we um, we sort of lost sight of. So I think there's something quite important in terms of what we're losing, above, like a price we're paying for, for our technological progress, in terms of actually dehumanising mm. us. So I suppose there's a the spirituality question is, can the religion be not something which is just about saying no all the time, but actually about recovering our full humanity in all its depth? That sounds like a critique <laughs> of capitalism, <laughs> actually. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So I know the two of you are involved in this in this sort of dialogue as to the uh, the role of uh, you know faith in society and th this that and the other thing. Uh, I guess the sort of a final question I have for both of you is: What do you people? What do you what do you, what would you like people to understand that they're not really understanding about this particular subject? Why is this important? I think for me, um, faith for for me and for lots of people is a core value. Hmm. And um, to be able to um, be in touch with all aspects of yourself and um, use them to influence or shape how you are in the world and what you do in the world is really important to, to have to have, um, you know, a work face and a private face, I think is, is a bit of a shame and that it, it, it does, it damages all of us if we're, we're hmm. if we're hidden um, and can't speak to who and what we are, or at least if we want to, it's not that you have to, but if you want to. Um, and I think I think that um, you know, there's I think there's certain ways of being being in the world that are acceptable, and some ways aren't. Um, and I I do think that a little bit that it's within an end of the wedge, um, and denies that um, there. I well, maybe not everyone believes that, but you know, there is. I I think that. Um, that we're more than what we see, that there's something else in the world, you know, more than us. So I think uh, for, for me, that is really, really important to be able to engage with, just at least to think about it, to open a, have an open conversation about it is is valuable, um, whether you, you agree or disagree, but the way that you would about anything else. Hmm. And I suppose I, what, what I add to that is there's something about where you're rooted. Um, uh, at a very deep level and mm -hmm. um and some of that you have to find out about by because it's so instinctual that you find out about it by meeting people who are in a different place 
but there's also something about the depth of the human connection with others where you can um engage at that level and let yourself yourself be rooted and enable the rootedness of somebody else and that's is incredibly important for sort of balanced functioning at depth rather than just sort of day-to-day survival yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even talked about the the interreligious conflict, um, which is also a part of this. Um, so, I mean, it's one thing we're, we're talking about the role of religion in society, but then, as you know, um, increasingly yeah. there are many religions, and there's a whole thing that's going on with that. And I don't know if any of you want to speak to that, but uh, it's a big, it's a bigger, it's a big thing here. I think I there are many, many religions um, in the UK as well, um, and some are are more spoken about than than others uh, i think the, the conflict still seems to be um in existence amongst the established ones you hear less about um things that are happen happening amongst the smaller against between the smaller religions but i don't know if you would you say that's true mark would you agree with that i mean broadly um i suppose there's something about the perception and um, um and then the reality of how people live out their faith and engage. Mm. And of course, the difficulty is that very often people um, are having deep connections within their own faith tradition. And it's quite a complicated task to then try and relate across faith traditions. Um, and I find it useful to do that in terms of what can I learn from another tradition? So you're in learning mode rather than anything else. Um, but it's... I suppose it's part of an increasing fragmentation in society. And that's not always as healthy as it might be. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I mean, we've very we've just basically just scratched the surface in a in a very um, you know, a very a very complex and actually sensitive topic. And uh, you know, I'd like to just thank you for being my guest. I just want to basically tell people if they want to know more about the diversity and spirituality network, they can go to our website every third Saturday. Um, we have an, we have an online event, um, that you can find out by going to our, our webpage and looking under events. And, uh, finally, if you like the podcast a lot and want to support it, you can support it by going to patreon.com and in effect become a sponsor of the show. And I'm wondering if there's any, um, you know, if if somebody wanted to engage with you with you all around these topics, how would they go about doing so? Well, one thing is that Karina and I are both doing an event or doing an event together in April, the eighth of April in London, under the auspices of an organisation called Opus. That's opus.org.uk, um, which is looking looking specifically at this at this whole issue. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you would send me a link to that, Mark, um, you know, I, I can, uh, you know, post it in the show notes and uh, maybe I'll even, if I get technological, I can make it, make it kind of a, a subhead. I, I'm not <laughs> promising that though. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any event, thank you very much for participating and um, thank your daughter also for, for humanizing our, using humanizing our. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much as well for your, for your time this evening. Thanks. Thank All right. Okay. Thank you very bye-bye. much. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is spirituality? What is spirituality?